All right, guys. So today we're gonna finish up chapter 21. I know you've had a test since we started it, so let's make sure you remember what we've done so far in chapter 21. With the immune system, we have two parts. We have innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. What we covered in our first discussion of chapter 21 was the innate immune system. That's the part that's completely not specific. You have no memory factor. That part is simply something has gotten into my body called a pathogen. That could be a bacteria, a virus, a protozoan, anything like that. Something has gotten into my body. The innate immune system just says, this is not me. I'm going to kill it. And, and that's it. Nothing else. When we were talking about the innate immune system, we went over the first and the second line of defense. The first line of defense is your skin and your mucous membrane, okay, the combination of the two. Your skin is a tough physical barrier. The cells are dead on the outside, held together by tight junctions. It's hard for things to get in. Your mucous membranes produce mucus. It traps any incoming pathogen. And there are also some things in addition to the mucus, like extremely acidic conditions. Um, certain enzymes are even secreted in the mucus. So that can serve as a way to trap and prevent anything from getting any further inside of you. Okay. Other than, now that we've got the first line of defense, the second line of defense involves two major cells. Both of them do the same thing. We have neutrophils and we have macrophages, which come from monocytes. Both of these cells are capable of phagocytosis. We went over phagocytosis. Phagocytosis was the process where the neutrophil or the macrophage sees some sort of incoming pathogen, reaches out, grabs that pathogen, pulls it into the body, forming a phagosome. Then the phagosome fuses with the lysosome. Now you've got all those little digestive enzymes. Start breaking down whatever's inside of the macrophage or the neutrophil now. Now this macrophage is going to spit out any little piece of the bacteria that is left. This piece of the bacteria that was originally found and went into the phagocytic cell, this could hurt you. That's why your macrophage killed it. All these little pieces that are released, they're small fragments. They can't hurt you. So the macrophage or the neutrophil can completely neutralize that threat. Now, it's very unlikely that just a few of the bacteria will get in. So in addition to just grabbing and killing the ones that the macrophage or the neutrophil can see, he also needs to begin to warn and activate the adaptive immune system. And that's kind of where we left off, that connection between how the innate immune system links to the adaptive immune system and what it does. Okay. While we were in the innate immune system, we did go over inflammation. Simply to explain, this is kind of a group of the different innate immune system cells working together. With inflammation, Following damage, the white blood cells were called to the area. That's leukocytosis. Then the white blood cells kind of scooch over to the edge. That's margination. Then the white blood cells leave the blood and come out into the damaged area. That process is called diapodesis. Now all of your white blood cells start screaming and spitting out chemicals. That's called chemotaxis. What makes it look like inflammation is when leukocytosis occurs, that blood vessel gets bigger and bigger and bigger so that more blood can flow to the area. That makes the area red. That makes the area hot. Okay? As all of the stuff is coming into the area and pushing out into the damaged tissue out of the blood, you get the swelling. Then you get the pain because of all the extra pressure on the area pushing on your pain receptors. Okay. So do we all understand the innate immune system? 
That, that's, that's the easy part. Okay? I see something. It's not supposed to be here. I'm going to kill it. The only option I have is let me eat it. As I eat it, I realize I'm probably not going to win this fight. So while I'm eating it, let me go ahead and call for some backup at the same time. Good? All right. So now we get to our adaptive immune system. And we said last time, the good part of the adaptive immune system and the reason we have it is it can react to any type of antigen that it is given. Okay? So what does that mean? That means it can react to a whole cell. It can react to the pieces of the cell that the macrophage has already eaten and broken down. Or it can also react to the macrophage holding it out and showing it to it. The adaptive immune system does not care how it looks. It has a way of reacting to it in any way. The other good part of the adaptive immune system, it has a memory factor. What we were talking about with the macrophage and the neutrophil, if it eats an E. coli two seconds later, it would eat another one and have no idea a connection between the two. It's not going to remember what it breaks down. It's just breaking it down blindly. T cells and B cells, which are our adaptive immune system, they have a way of remembering exactly what they broke down. And every time they see it after the first time, every subsequent infection, they can react faster and stronger, faster and stronger. The downside to the adaptive immune system is they cannot be activated until the innate immune system has been activated first. Okay? And that's simply because we do not want it taken off and going crazy and fighting something it's not supposed to fight. So we do have to follow the stepwise path. First line of defense, then second line of defense, then adaptive immune system. Okay? So now we're ready to look at the different parts of the adaptive immune system. We all remember what an antigen is, right? Remember I drew the piece of bacteria and I said that the whole bacteria is the pathogen. Any little piece of the bacteria can be an antigen. That's the part of the bacteria that the T cell or B cell is going to react upon. Okay? So let's, we did that slide. We're here. Okay? So you all agree with me that you completely understand what a macrophage and a neutrophil does, right? Okay. So now let me say to you, a macrophage and a neutrophil are both antigen presenting cells. It's the same thing. Antigen present, it, we start calling a macrophage or a neutrophil an antigen presenting cell once they have already engulfed and broken down a bacteria. Okay? So in that first picture where we were looking at the order and the way that a macrophage could destroy a cell, I'm going to draw my macrophage as a Pac-Man, because I think it makes a little more sense. Okay, we all remember Pac-Man. Did y'all play Pac-Man as a kid? I did. I had an Atari, though. I'll tell you how old I am. I had an Atari. But so we played Pac-Man as a kid. Pac-Man's job was to walk around and just eat everything, right? That's how your phagocytic cells work. So if my macrophage, my neutrophil, whichever one it is, it comes in contact with a little bacteria, it's going to grab, eat that bacteria, right, bring it into the cell, if this is a little better. No, Oop, not, of course not better. It doesn't even work. Okay, now I have that little bacteria in my cell. Then it starts breaking the bacteria down, spitting all the little pieces out, right? That's the process we already went over. In addition to doing this, the macrophage also takes one little piece of that antigen. I'm trying to draw a triangle or some shape, it doesn't matter, I don't care what shape you draw, it's just the way it's usually done in a book, takes one little piece of this bacteria and sticks it out on a protein and waves it around. Now this is not just called a phagocyte, now this is a phagocyte that has presented an antigen, right? And you know, we went over this a little bit last time. If I present you with an award, I'm handing it to you, right? I'm showing it to you. This phagocytic cell is taking this antigen and presenting it to the T cells and B cells. It's saying, hey, here it is. I need you to work on this for me. Okay? This is what I found. It's bad. We need to all work together to kill it. Okay? Now, the 
as we now go into the adaptive immune system, we've got two types of cells. We have T cells and B cells. The T cells are the ones that are going to come over here and react to the presented antigen. There's more than one type of T cell we're going to go over. But all of the T cells need the antigen presented to them. Okay? The B cells, which we're going to talk about, they actually react down here to the little spit out pieces. Okay? And so at first a lot of students kind of think, well, I just, why? Why not have them react to the same thing? Because now you've got two different armies coming in to fight the same thing. Your T cells, they're going to help the phagocytes. Right? The phagocytes are steady trying to eat this stuff. The B cells are going to come over and say, OK, I see it. I got it. I got the idea. I know what I'm supposed to fight. Let me go do my thing. The B cells, they can't interact in the same place the T cell can, because then you have, you know, stuff would be in the way of each other. So the B cells come down here, and the B cells just grab any of the little pieces of waste product that have already been spit out by a phagocyte, and they react to it. Does that make sense? It's kind of an important distinction. The T cell, it's not necessarily talking about what they kill. The B cells know what to kill because they're looking at the waste product spit out by the phagocyte. The T cells know what to do because they're looking at what's presented by the phagocytic cell. Okay? No, 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 they're not going to eat it. They're just looking at it. Remember what these pieces are. These are little pieces of the bacteria, right? The B cell does not have the ability to see this bacteria and know what to do. It needs the phagocytic cell to break it down and there will be pieces. Okay? This whole bacteria that goes into the phagocyte, that's a pathogen, right? What are the little pieces spit out called? Antigens. So the B cell, and you'll read this in your textbook, and I don't think they do a very good job explaining it. It will say your B cell reacts to soluble antigen. And most people don't really understand where the heck did the soluble antigen come from. They're reacting to the little pieces of stuff that have been spit out by the phagocytic cell that's floating in your blood. The B cells, if they see these little pieces, that means the phagocyte found something, right? Otherwise, those little pieces wouldn't be there. Can you guys make that connection? Okay. T cells, same thing. They don't know what to do with the whole bacteria. They need the phagocytic cell to actually show it to them. The T cells are a little bit lazier. They're not even going to go search for it in the blood themselves. They want something to show it to them. Okay? All right. So what do the B cells do? Let's finally learn what our B cells and our T cells do. I know the picture looks kind of scary at first, but it's not. Your B cells do two things. Okay? So these are supposed to be little B cells hanging out here at the top. All right? The little red flowers, that is the little pieces of antigen that we were talking about right here that were spit out by a phagocytic cell. Does that make sense? You got to make the connection between what we were just talking about and what we're talking about now. These little red flowers up here, pieces of a bacteria that have already been recognized and broken down by the phagocytic cell. The B cell is now responding to them so that the B cell can create its army, what it's going to do, so that the B cells can now go find any more of those bacteria that may be in your body and help the phagocytes destroy it. Does that make sense? Okay. Remember, when the phagocytic cell eats that one bacteria and poops out the waste, he just ate one, right? Is there just one? No. So when he's pooping out that waste, the B cell finds it, looks at it, and says, okay, I got it. This is what it looks like. All right, let's go. And then the B cell is going to get ready to go help fight that same infection. Better? Okay. So our B cells recognize the antigen that has already been processed by the phagocytic cell. And then our B cells do what we call proliferate. Proliferate means the B cell that is able to respond to that antigen starts dividing like crazy, creating tons and tons of B cells that can fight that. Okay? Once enough of them are made, the B cell kind of changes its form a little bit, and it turns into two different types of cells. The B cell 
makes plasma cells. Show y'all where we're at on the slide. I'm not making stuff up. The B cell makes plasma cells, and the B cell makes memory cells. That's the two things they do. Okay, so from the beginning, the B cell recognized the antigen and said, oh, this is something I need to fight. So he starts making a whole bunch more of his cells, and now they're ready to fight, so they get their fighting gear on. They change into plasma cells and memory cells. Okay? The process of going from a basic B cell proliferating and then turning into a plasma cell and a memory cell, that can take several days up to several weeks. Okay? That can take time. Have you ever gotten an infection and not died from it? Yes, you all have, right? And you didn't go to the doctor, and you didn't go get antibiotics, you just got better. Why? Because over time, your B cells were shown, hey, this is what's making her sick or him sick, and your B cells start this process. Okay? Now, I know you can guess what memory cells do, but let's do the plasma cells first. Once these plasma cells are made, plasma cells produce antibodies. Okay? These antibodies that are made will specifically bind only the original antigen that activated the B cell. Those antibodies are specific for this infection. At the same time, there may be another B cell over here that finds a, a, a different piece of a bacteria, right? It may make plasma cells and it may make antibodies, but antibodies are specific for the original antigen that activated the B cell. Okay? In your mind right now, you should be thinking, well, I still don't really understand what the, anti what the antibody is doing. You're not supposed to yet. Okay, I haven't told you yet. At this point, you need to understand the B cell recognized something bad. B cell became plasma cell and memory cell. Plasma cell makes the antibody. Okay? So what does the antibody do? We're going to talk about the memory in just a second. Here's the antibody. We always draw antibodies like a Y. And that's because if you actually look at the molecular shape, the makeup of it, it, it is a Y. Every antibody has what we call the constant region and the variable region. These are the two heavy chains. And these are the two light chains. It, heavy light meaning size. If you're a bigger person, you weigh more. If you're a smaller person, you weigh less. Okay? So what does the constant and variable mean? If something is constant, what does that mean? stays the same, it never changes. All right. Every antibody in my body, the bottom part of it down here, the constant region, looks exactly the same. You can't take my antibodies and treat your sickness because your constant region of your antibodies looks different than mine. Okay? That's just your body's way of making sure everything it makes belongs in your body. There's one piece of it that always looks like you. Okay? These top two pieces at the top, this side and this side, that is the variable region. The variable region, what's the variable do? Changes. That's the part of the antibody that can bind to the antigen it was specifically made against. Okay? I know I'm going slow, but for some reason this is, this is hard for some people. So I want to make sure I don't leave anybody. If I leave you, you've got, you got to let me know. All right? So where did this come from? Phagocyte ate the bacteria, spit out the pieces. The B cell saw the piece and said, okay, this is something I need to kill. So the B cell made the antibody. This antibody will bind to the little pieces spit out by the phagocyte. But those little pieces spit out by the phagocyte are part of the whole bacteria, right? So this antibody can go bind that original bacteria. Does that make sense? So you went, oh, okay, I like that. I like that, oh. All right, so it can go bind the original bacteria that it's trying to do something with. So finally, would you like to know, what is it going to do to that bacteria? Variable region binds to the antigen. The antigen is just a piece of the original bacteria that this is trying to fight. Okay? 
So finally, what can it do when it binds that original bacteria? It can do a lot of things, but it, it kind of does what we would get, say, four major processes in your body. And of course, we have to give it really fancy names for everything that it can do, but it's not what it does is not complicated. Okay? The first thing that we say it does is neutralizes. Okay? What does neutralize mean? Kind of takes the threat away, right? You should be able to predict, predict, predict that a little protein can't go kill a cell, right? Obviously, the antibody is not just going to go kill, kill the original bacteria. But if those antibodies all start binding that bacteria, then the bacteria may be neutralized. It may still be in your body, but it can't hurt you anymore. Okay? Think about it this way. If a bacteria wants to hurt your cell, the first thing it needs to do is bind to your cell, right? Makes sense. A virus is the same way. If a virus wants to make you sick, that virus needs to be able to bind to your cell. If it's completely covered up with antibodies, it has no way of binding to you. So it's still there. It's still alive. But it's just going to float right by and not be able to bind and hurt anything in your body. So that's one thing antibodies do. Does that make sense? The other process of an antibody is called agglutination, which sounds bad. Agglutination means a binding effect. Okay, so if you see in this picture, I don't know why they used red blood cells as an example, but this could be bacteria. Okay? A whole bunch of these antibodies can start working together. They have one part, all of your antibodies have one part that's the same, right? The constant region, that can bind to each other. So they can take their constant regions and bind them to each other, and then take their variable regions sticking out at the top and grab a bacteria. So antibody one says, I got one, right? Antibody two hooks on and says, okay, I got one too. If a whole bunch of them get together, you're eventually going to end up with this giant clump of bacteria that can't do anything to you. Okay? When your body sees a giant clump of something in your blood, for example, your body realizes clump equals bad. Blood's supposed to be thin. So that's just a giant sign that says, okay, I'm an antibody. I can't kill this, but I clumped them all together. Somebody else come kill this. Okay. All right. Other one is precipitation. Precipitation. So think about it this way: if we say that it's, we have precipitation occurring outside, what's happening? Something's falling. Rain is falling. Snow is falling. Something like that is happening, right? Okay. If a bunch of the antibodies clump together, you may have the big clump precipitate out of solution. So it's kind of just falling out of solution. It can't do anything to you then. Agglutination and precipitation are real similar to each other. Both of them, in one way or another, make giant clumps, which allow something else to see the giant clump, realize, OK, we need to just really start working on it, get this out of the way. Okay? Trying to think of a comparison that's not as gruesome, but I can't. If you were going to try to shoot somebody, what would be easier? Shoot the one person that was standing there, if there was a whole big old crowd of them, and you shot into it. You can hit somebody in the big crowd, right? These phagocytic cells, they don't know where to go. They're just floating around in your blood. They may miss that one little bacteria sitting there. But if there's a giant clump of bacteria over here, they're probably going to see that giant clump and then go over there and start really working on that. Okay. The last thing antibodies do is they help complement, which complement is something I told you we just weren't really going to fool with a whole lot right now. But if you recall, complement was something I told you complements or helps all the other activities that we're talking about. Okay, so if complement's going to come in and help the phagocytes work, then the antibodies are just helping complement work. Okay, are you seeing how all of this is starting to kind of overlap and crisscross, right? It's not that way to intentionally confuse you. It's that way to make sure if something comes into your body, it doesn't kill you. It 
your body has a way of fighting it off. Okay? So all the way from the beginning. E. coli got in. Phagocyte killed it. Just the one. Broke it down, spit out some pieces. B cell said, I need to come help with this. So B cell recognizes the piece. B cell made the antibodies. The antibodies then go back to the original cell and then help get rid of all those original cells. B cells actually make the antibodies. No, the B cell made the antibody. The antibody is helping all the other cells in your body kill the original bacteria. Correct. And that's a good way of saying it. The B cell, all it can do is recognize it and make the antibodies. The antibodies are what's actually going back and helping destroy the original infection. But you got to keep in mind, too, antibodies are just proteins. They're not magical. A protein can't just go kill a cell. So it's a process that we have to go through. Right. Well, correct. Correct. And when, a, when I say a B cell turns in, a B cell proliferates, that one B cell becomes thousands of B cells. Then those thousand B cells become thousands of plasma cells. The thousand plasma cells produce a hundred thousand antibodies. So we're not just making a few of these. All of a sudden you're getting a blast of hundreds of thousands of antibodies released into your blood. Every single one of those antibodies is going after that original bacteria that was put in your body. Go for it. No. Antibiotics, um, there's lots of different types of antibiotics. Your oldest and most common antibiotics bind to peptidoglycan, which is a component of bacterial cell wall. It's just a chemical that destroys that cell wall. None of your cells have that. Some of your newer um, antibiotics are chemicals that bind to bacterial ribosomes. Some of you have had micro, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? All right. Bacterial ribosomes are smaller than your ribosomes, so that chemical can block the protein synthesis of a bacteria and not yours. No. Antibiotics hurt your immune system. You would not see me take an antibiotic unless I felt like I was about to die. My child has taken antibiotics five times in two years. You should, don't be one of those parents that wants your kid to take an antibiotic every time they sneeze. You're, you're hurting their immune system big time. Let them eat some dirt. Let them eat a bug. It's really gross at the time. The time she put the beetle in her mouth was the grossest to me because it was still alive. It's really creepy. But I mean, you know, she's healthy. All right. So are we, <laughs> are we feeling okay so far? I know you guys don't like the immune system. But I'm trying my best to make it <laughs> where you can understand it. All right? So let's think about this memory f factor. We haven't talked about that yet, right? So all the way back at the beginning, when we made all of these first antibodies, we also made the memory cell. With the first infection, that memory cell didn't do anything. But that memory cell, look where it is on the scale, right? We said this first step takes several days, a week. The second step takes possibly another week. Okay? This memory cell, when you are exposed to the exact same antigen again, that memory cell can immediately proliferate, become plasma cells, which make what? Antibodies. Okay? Those antibodies will go back and start fighting the original infection, right? The time it takes to make a memory cell proliferate is not even a fourth of the time it takes to activate a B cell for the first time. Okay? And even in this little drawing, what do you think makes more antibodies, the first exposure or the second exposure? Second exposure. Okay? So let's make this real life, right? Have you had the chicken pox? Yes, you had the chicken pox when you were a kid. If you didn't, just play along, okay? 
pretend you had the chicken pox. If you didn't, you had a vaccine, and we'll talk about vaccines in a second. Okay? You had the chicken pox. The first time you got the chicken pox, the virus went into your body, and you started breaking out in a rash and itching. While you were bro broken out, this stuff was occurring. You had phagocytic cells and natural killer cells. You had all those cells of the innate immune system. They saw the chicken pox virus, but they just couldn't kill it fast enough. As they saw it, they broke it down into pieces. Your original B cells saw it. right? They started proliferating. You're still sick, but your B cells are trying. They make some antibodies. Eventually, did you die from chicken pox? Nope, you're still alive today, right? Eventually, your B cells made enough antibodies. That virus was denatured completely, and you're okay. At that same time, you made this memory cell. Okay? Have you ever had chicken pox again? Nope. Does that mean you've never inhaled the virus again? No, of course you did. Right? Probably the very next week or two you inhaled it because some of your buddies had it at school or something like that. When you inhale it the second time, you didn't get a rash or anything because as soon as you inhaled it, your memory cell saw that antigen and said, oh, I know what this is, and immediately, within hours, started making an army of antibodies that could kill all of those viruses that got in your body before they could make you sick. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's because the flu mutates. Okay, so try to explain that simply to you. When viruses replicate, they don't have a way of checking to make sure they've copied their nucleic acid correctly. And they grow, most of your viruses mutate so fast, I mean, excuse me, replicate so fast, mutations are real common. The flu is one that is known for changing almost every time it replicates. So each year, it is the flu, but it's a different virus. That's why you can get it over and over and over again. Okay. There's also some viruses that remain in our body, never go away, but they change just enough while they're in our body that our immune system can't keep them under control completely all the time, even though you have memory cells. An example of that would be herpes. Anybody in here get fever blisters? Nothing gross about it if you do. I get fever blisters. We all have that virus because it's in the air, so we all have it. But since I get fever blisters, that just means that every now and then that virus that's in my body changes just enough that my darn B cells have to go through the whole process of making memory cells again, and that's when you get the fever blister. And then eventually it goes away, and you may not get one for years. That's because the virus, every time it tries to start increasing in number in your body, your memory cells say, no, no, make antibodies, get it under control. Well, that's just because the virus, that particular virus is activated by cellular damage. And the sun damages your, your skin. Stress can also activate them. And that's also the same reason stress releases free radicals in your body, causes cellular damage. Because viruses are actually really hard to kill by B cells. You're asking me complex questions. I don't mind answering them. But viruses are a little harder to deal with because they go into your cells. So a lot of viruses can get in your cell and hide. Can your antibody attack your cell? No. Okay, and warts are caused by viruses too. Okay. So what does this have to do with vaccinations? Do you think when you get a vaccine, they put the live bacteria in your body? No, you could get sick from a vaccine then. Back 100 years ago, yeah, that's what we did. Okay. The original smallpox vaccines were cowpox. And you would get a rash, but it would protect you from smallpox. So how does that work? Let's say I get a, I'm trying to think of a bacteria. Let's say I get a um, meningitis vaccine. That's a vaccination to protect me from bacterial meningitis. Okay? Do you think they give me the bacteria that could cause meningitis? Of course not. Would I take it if they put that bacteria in my body? No, I'm trying to avoid getting meningitis, right? So the way they make a vaccine 
if this whole thing is the bacteria, they'll take just one little piece of the bacteria and they stick that in the vaccine. So let's think about it. What did this B cell react to, the whole bacteria? No, a little piece of it, right? The little piece that was spit out by the phagocytic cell. So when we make a vaccine, we just bypass the innate immune system. We go ahead and chop up the bacteria into something small that can't make you sick. There's no way this one little piece can give me meningitis. But my B cells can act, be activated by that one little piece. And when I get that one little piece shot in my arm, my B cells proliferate. My B cells make some antibodies. Oh, well, so what? I don't need them right now. I don't have the bacteria, but they're not hurting anything. The important thing is I also make a memory cell specific against this one little piece of this bacteria. So if I do come in contact with the bacteria two years later, my memory cell recognizes it immediately, makes my army of antibodies, my antibodies go destroy that bacteria before I can get meningitis. Pretty neat, right? Go ahead, Jen. Yes, your vaccine basically takes the place of your innate immune system. Okay? So why do you think we have to have booster shots? Right? Poor little kids, we poke them all the time, right? We give them a, a DTP when they're three months old, and then when they're six months old, we give them another one. Their immune system's not that strong at first. They make a couple of memory cells, but then if they don't come in contact with the actual DT or P, what the vaccine is made against, those memory cells will eventually get old and die. So we have to give them another vaccine, build them a new army of memory cells. Okay? If you guys haven't had a DTP in 10 years, it doesn't matter. You're not children. You still need to get a booster to that vaccine because your memory cells, the last time you got that shot, you were one year old. Okay? And you may have got it when you were five. I'm not there yet. Kara's only two, so I don't know. But it's been at least 15 years since you got that shot. Do you think your memory cells are still as good today as they were 15 years ago? No. Are you as good today as you were 15 years ago? I'm not, right? So the, your, your immune system can age, and you have to challenge it over and over again. Go ahead, and then I'll come back there, Jen. Okay. Can you, is it possible to get chicken pox again one day when you're older? What's it called? Shingles is the exact same thing. The reason we don't get shingles when we're 10, I know it's possible, it's very unlikely. The reason you don't get shingles when you're 10 and you get shingles when you're 50 or 60 is because your immune system does get old after a while. And you say, well, I haven't had the chicken pox since then. You have been challenged, though. You have inhaled the chicken pox virus. And every time you inhale it, even if you don't break out, it challenges your immune system. I saw Gretchen and Jen, so I don't care which way y'all go. You say you saying why do you have to have three? I thought you said why don't you? And I was thinking I don't know where you went. You do have to have three. Uh, well. Hepatitis B is actually a vaccine that's produced from a fungus, and so this is a lot harder to explain. The reason you need three rounds of it is because they increase the dosage each time they give it to you. Because think about it, yeah, they're trying to protect you from a virus, but do they want to inject you with a giant concentration of the fungus? No, that could end up being bad too. So you get the three rounds of it to build up enough of an army. Jen, and then we'll come over here. You figured it out, okay? Lifespan of a memory cell is different for different people. When you're a baby, your memory cells may only last a few months. As you get older, your immune system does mature and get better, and then your memory cells can last for years. Okay? They just they just lose their efficiency. Do you have questions for me? I mean, I don't mind y'all talking to each other, but it's really hard to concentrate when y'all start all talking to each other. Okay? So 
that is, we said that's how vaccinations work. That's artificial immunity, right? Fake. You didn't do it naturally. You can also actually just get a shot of antibodies, but that's really rare. Why would it be hard for me, somebody, to give you a shot of my antibodies? Because my antibodies are made from my body. They have their, my constant region. Your antibodies are different. Usually when you see antibody, they're called immunoglobulin injections. Have you ever heard of those? Immunoglobulin is just another word for antibody. It means exactly the same thing. You're only going to see those like with siblings or um, parent-child. You know, you can't just, some random stranger off the street can't give you their antibodies. It, it just doesn't match up. Well, yeah, because that's where your antibodies live is in your blood. Yeah. Okay. There is a form of a natural immunity that you can get other than getting sick. Some of you may have gotten somebody's antibodies when you were an infant. How does that occur? Breastfeeding. Why do, we, why do scientific people especially harp on you need to breastfeed your child? Because what's in your milk? We don't care about the milk. Yeah, we can make milk. What we can't make is the antibody that comes from the mother. So when I had a child, if I breastfed her, every memory cell I had in my body, every antibody I had in my body, I just gave to her during the breastfeeding. That can't last forever. That's only going to last for about three months or so on average. Guess what we do to a baby when they turn three months old? Start giving them vaccinations. That's when now their immune system has matured enough. They can make their own antibodies, and they don't need mamas anymore. After about the three-month point, there really is no scientific need to breastfeed your child. I'm not telling you you shouldn't. Don't go tell somebody I said that. If you want to breastfeed them until they're 15, that is completely your prerogative. There is just uh, no scientific reason to do so beyond that, that first, even really honestly, the first few weeks. After the first few weeks, you've given them all of the antibodies you're going to produce, and you're just giving them milk beyond that. Can you give your child somebody else's breast milk? You can. You can buy it. You can sell it. I didn't. I gave mine away. My child was premature, and her, her digestive system, she couldn't handle the even breast milk when she was a baby. And I had pumped a truckload of it, so... I gave it away and gave it to some other little kid, and he drank it. So it can be, you can give another kid your antibodies, and he's a big, strapping, healthy little boy now. So you can give it away or sell it if you don't. But your child is very similar to you because when they're an infant, their immune system is so new, they'll accept it. Mm-hmm. No, uh, no, not really. It was a kind of a friend of a friend. It was more of a, I was kind of irritated one day, and my, one of my good friends was at the house. I'm like, what am I going to do with this crap, you know? Like, I have, okay, those of you that are breastfed, it's not easy. It's not fun. So it's pretty irritating if you realize all of a sudden you've got, you know, 100 gallons of this milk in the freezer, and it's expensive to get, you got to buy little sterile packages and do all this crap. And I was complaining that I had done all that, and then Kara couldn't drink it. The doctor had just told us, this is what's wrong. She can't have that. And she, her cousin was adopting a baby from a, like, 14-year-old girl that had gotten raped, and that's why she was pregnant. So, of course, the little 14-year-old girl didn't want to breastfeed. And so, you know, I just tell my friend, well, ask her if she wants it. I don't care. And she took it, and she gave it to him. So I, at least I get to feel like I did a good thing. Even though I was complaining and that's how I found out about it, I get to feel like I did a good thing. But, I mean, you can go to Forest General and buy breast milk for your child if you don't want to do it. I have no idea. I know some people will pay a lot of money for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that's kind of weird personally, but... <laughs> Uh, there's a pill you can take that will make you produce breast milk. They have they have that now. It's all hormonal. Um, and, you know, years and years ago, hundreds of years ago, there were things called wet nurses. And that's because if you were a really wealthy woman, you didn't breastfeed your own children. Because generally breastfeeding is not 
something that is really a good, helps you look really good. I don't know how to say this nicely. Usually you don't look quite the same after you've breastfed. So a lot of those really wealthy women would pay other women to come breastfeed their children because they didn't want to do it. I'm not, right, your breasts don't look the same usually after you. <laughs> Milk. Yeah, if you guys want to hear something crazy, which I know we're not talking about hormones anymore, but when a newborn is breastfed, sometimes they will start producing milk in their little tiny breast. How could that be possible? Because when you're breastfeeding them, well, no, it's not like, no, actual milk will come out. Okay, when your baby's drinking your breast milk, they're not just getting antibodies and milk, they're getting every hormone in your body too. A lot of little babies will have a slight blood that comes out in their urine because they, they, if a woman breastfeeds them, she's got hormones that are making her produce milk, which is what? Prolactin. She's also got oxytocin still going, trying to get the uterus to contract and go back to normal, which makes a woman bleed to get rid of all of the afterbirth and the placenta and things like that. And the baby gets those hormones. And some little babies, I'm not talking about like massive milk, but you'll see a little teeny tiny drop of milk come out of a baby's nipples. Like it happened to my child and it freaked me out. I didn't know what was going on. And I called the nurse in there and she just looked at me like I was an idiot. Like, well, you're making milk. Of course she can too. Excuse me. It, it could. It could. Yeah, it could. Just like little mini boobs, yeah. <laughs> it happened. And see, but nobody, t I'm t I tell you guys this stuff not because I think you want to know every ounce of my personal life. I tell you because I think you may want to know some things so you don't look like that idiot in the, uh, you know, maternity ward like I did. Like, what the heck is this? Like, you know, so that's why I tell you guys these things. All right, so we got a couple more things to go over. We've done our B cells, right? We need to see what our T cells do. The T cell is actually much, much more simpler than the B cell. That's why I do the B cell first. Okay? The T cell is the easy one. When your T cells are activated, they are going to, you're going to have two different T cells. Okay? There's a CD8 T cell and a CD4 T cell. I don't like those names because you know how science is. They love to change stuff. A CD4 cell is what we call a regulatory and a helper T cell. So that's one group. And then the other group becomes a cytotoxic T cell. I'm sorry that looks so horrific. I'm going to have to work on this computer a little bit. I know why it's doing crazy stuff. All right. So a lot of times we don't write out the whole word because when I mean, we're scientists, we're lazy. So we'll call a helper T cell a TH cell. We call a regulatory T cell a T reg, and we call a cytotoxic T cell a TC. Okay, so you'll see that a lot of times as you're going through. Okay, so since our T cell is going to split into two different groups, obviously they're going to do different things, right? Okay, so let's look at what the helper T cell does first. Since it's called a helper T cell, what do you think it does? It helps everything else. Okay? The helper T cell, you need to remember one big word as you're studying all of this. The helper T cell's main job in your body is to give permission. Okay? So let's look at what's going on in this little picture right here that's kind of a bluish green color. Okay? This is a B cell, right? Yeah, that's a B cell. Okay. So here's our helper T cell. It's coming over here and it's bound to a B cell. Okay? What did we just want a B cell does when it's exposed to antigen? Makes antibodies, right? It goes through several steps. It makes the antibody in the memory cell. When it gets ready to do that, the B cell finds the antigen. The B cell's ready. It shows the antigen it has to the TH and it says, do I have your permission to make my antibodies? The TH looks at it and says, yes, you're good to go. This is an antigen we need to be fighting. 
and the Th cell gives the B cell permission to make the antibodies. It says yes or no. Not yet. The T cells are going to do something too. But yeah, in this instance, the B cell is the one that's doing the work. The Th is just giving permission. It secretes little chemicals. It's all a chemical signal. If the TH cell thinks it's something the B cell should do, it releases little chemicals and then the B cell goes. If the TH says this is something you should leave alone, it releases different chemicals and the B cell will quit. Okay? So some of you probably should think, why do we need this extra step? But think about it. Why do we need this extra step? So the B cells don't start attacking not only bacteria, but anything they're not supposed to attack, right? What if we had some heart damage and we end up with some small fragment proteins in our heart or in our blood? And the B cell says, hey, I see it. Looks good to me. And then our B cell starts making antibodies that attack our heart cells. That would be really bad, right? So you always need this little TH, this helper cell, to come in and say, yes, this is something you should kill, or no, do not destroy the heart. We kind of need that. Okay? How does the TH know? Go all the way back in your mind when we were talking about this antigen presenting cell right here, right? What did I tell you the T cell did? Looks at the piece of antigen the phagocyte found. That's how the TH knows it's something that it's supposed to attack. The phagocyte has already broken it down. Okay? So don't you can't lose what we've already went over. So TH give a, gives B cells permission. Okay. TH also gives permission to a TC cell. This picture right here looks complicated, but it's not. Here's your TH cell activate, interacting with a phagocyte. Why? Well, the phagocyte's the first one that gets activated, right? Phagocyte has eaten the bacteria, showed it to the TH, the TH is looking at it saying, oh, yep, you found something bad. So it immediately starts secreting out a chemical that tells the TC, go to work. Okay. What do you think a cytotoxic T cell does? What does cyto mean? Cell. What does toxic mean? Destroy. A cytotoxic T cell, finally, this is the only cell in your immune system they can just walk right up to an entire cell and go poof, kill it. Okay. Why did we have to go through all those steps to get to this? To make sure you should kill it. Because killing something you don't want to kill causes an autoimmune disease. There's no cure for autoimmune diseases. You will eventually not necessarily die from the autoimmune disease, but you will have it until you die if you have one. There's no cure for it. So how does a TC cell work? This TC cell has already been told by the TH to go to work. The TC cell binds the target cell. The target cell is the original bacteria, whatever has come into our body. When it binds that target cell, this is kind of a blow up of the two of them interacting together. Okay? The TC cell starts releasing these little enzymes. The little enzymes go in and poke a hole in the bacteria, open up the membrane, and then all the nasty enzymes that will kill it leak into the cell, and it, the cell dies. It's a very, very fast death, a very efficient death. So we have to regulate it really, really specifically. Once they're dead and they're broken down into pieces, the pieces float through our lymphatic or our blood until they come in contact with either they get small enough that they can be excreted in your urine or something like that or your feces or they're broken down further by your lymph nodes and things like that. Once it gets small enough, it just comes out of your body. Just the TH. Mm -hmm. TC does nothing. Think of it this way. Your TC is kind of the big guy that's quiet and stands back in the corner. Right? He's not the first one to go fight, right? He just kind of hangs back in the corner, watches everything that goes on. 
And when it's time and the situation finally needs to be dealt with and ended, that's when the big guy comes out and just ends the situation, right? That's your TC cell. He's just kind of hanging out in the background. That's your killer cell. He just hangs out in the background until it's like, okay, y'all did all this bickering and fighting and it wasn't taken care of, fine. I'm going to come out and take care of it. Okay? There is one other type, but you notice there's not much written on here. There are other T cells called the regulatory T cells. They are very, very close cousins to the TH. They're also just kind of coming in there and sticking in and making sure everything is regulated. They make sure everybody doesn't get too excited. So if the TCs start working, the T regs will come over there and say, slow down just a little bit. You know, let's not get too carried away. We don't need to destroy everything in the body. So they're just kind of regulating the action of everything else. But we're not going to really talk about those too much. Okay. I want to put it all together for you. It won't take me long, but I just want to make sure you, I don't want you to lose the overall picture as we've gone through the details. Okay, as soon as I get my little board to pop up here. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I looked at you and then I forgot. Go ahead. Yes, when you get an organ transplant that is rejected, that means your immune system recognized that organ as foreign and your, all the cells start working to destroy that organ. This is also what happens, remember back when we were talking about blood typing? We were talking about you can't have an antibody that matches the antigen. This is why. Because if you had an antibody that matched the antigen on the red blood cell, it would destroy that red blood cell. So your immune system would start killing that blood. Okay? So let's see if my pen's going to behave. If not, I'll just do this on the board. Okay? So here comes our original bacteria got in the body, right? What's the first thing that happened? First it had to get past our first line of defense, right? Had to get past our skin. Now it's past our first line of defense. Here comes Pac-Man. Phagocytic cell comes in, right? Second line of defense. Phagocytic cell ingests that bacteria and it does two things to it. It breaks it down into little bitty pieces, right? And it also sticks it out on the, a piece of it out on the surface to show to the other cells. Okay? The little bitty pieces my B cell is going to come over here, look at those little pieces, and say, all right, this is something I need to get rid of, right? So my B cell, now my pen stopped working, right? My B cell turns into plasma cells that are going to make antibodies, and my B cell also makes a memory cell. Oh, I hate this thing. Okay? The antibodies go back up here and start fighting the original cells, right? Okay. At the same time this is occurring, my T helper cell is over here looking at what the antigen presenting cell is showing him, right? TH secretes the chemicals and tells TC, go kill the cells. So TC then switches into kill mode. And you can also draw you a little line. Try a different color. TH also comes down here and gives permission. Now, now this is a horrific looking picture. Sorry, I apologize. But I want you to see that it all works together, right? Once this group of bacteria comes in, everything that else that happens is all aimed at the antibodies or the TC cells coming back and helping you kill the original infection. Okay? Get a different color. Everything below this purple line is adaptive immune system. The only thing that is innate immune system is what's above the purple line. 
innate immune system is your skin and your phagocytic cell. Once that phagocytic cell eats that very first bacteria, your B's and T's start working. B's make antibody, TH's tell the B's to do that, and the TH's tell the TC's to kill. So does that make it better? Can you, can you see how it all fits together? <laughs>